Good day everyone, my name is Mr. Mike James Palay. We're gonna be discussing about gender and sexuality. Understanding gender and sexuality. Gender is not the same as sex, despite the fact that two are frequently used interchangeably. Gender refers to the socially constructed qualities of women, men, girls, and boys. This covers the standards, behaviors, and roles that come with being a woman, man, girl, or boy, as well as interpersonal interactions. Gender as a socially construct differs from one society to the next and can change through time. Gender is also made up of two parts. The first one is our internal sense of gender or gender identity and how we express our or exhibit ourselves to the outside or gender expression or presentation. Meanwhile, sexuality refers to the sexual sensations, thoughts, desires, and behaviors toward others. Other people can be physically or sexually appealing to someone. All of these qualities are a component of sexuality. Sexuality is unique and special to each individual, and it is an integral aspect of who they are. It's about who we're sexually and rom romantically attracted to, whether it's individuals of the same gender identity as people of different gender identities, many of gender identities, or those with no sexual attraction at all. Let's proceed now to feminism. Feminism is an interdisciplinary approach to gender, gender expression, gender identity, sex, and sexuality as understood by uh, social ideas and political engagement. Feminism has progressed over time from a critical study of gender inequalities to a more nuanced focus on the social and formative constructions of gender and sexuality. Feminist theory currently seeks to examine inequalities and inequities along the intersectional lines of ability, class, gender, racism, sex, and sexuality. And feminists wants to influence change in areas where these intersectionalities generate power inequality. Our kids can go into the world conscious of injustices and try to change unhealthy dynamics in any situation by engaging in intellectual and academic discussion of these imbalances. Reproductive rights, domestic violence, fairness, social justice, and workplace issues such as family, medical leave, equal pay, and sexual harassment and discrimination are among subjects that feminists political activists advocate on. So there are four different feminism types of feminism, namely the radical feminism, the Marxist feminism, liberal feminism, and difference or modern feminism, postmodern feminism rather. Accordingly, Radical feminism holds men responsible for women's exploitation. The majority of men have been benefited from women's subordination. Women are a major marginalized group. Rape, violence, and pornography have been all used by men to gain and maintain authority over women. Furthermore, radical feminists have frequently been involved in the establishment and operation of refuges for women who have been victims of male violence. Capitalism, rather than patriarchy, is the primary source of women's oppression in Marxist feminism. With capitalists as primary beneficiaries, women's subordination serves as a variety of essential functions for capitalism, including the free reproduction of the labor force or socialization is done for free. Women's disadvantage is considered as a result of the rise of private property and their lack of control over the means of production. Liberal feminism pinpoints that nobody benefits from existing inequalities, which is both men and women are harmed. Gender inequality is explained in this way by society's culture and values rather than its structure and institutions. Men and women's expectations are strict and inflexible as a result of their socialization into gender roles. Women are denied equal chances because of discrimination.
Liberal feminists do not desire revolutionary change. Instead, they wish to see reforms within the present system. So the fourth one is the distinction between feminism or post-modern feminism. Women are not seen as a single homogeneous group in difference feminism and post-modern feminism. Rather than politics and opportunities, it is interested on language or discourses and link between power and knowledge. So let's proceed now to women at this cinema. Mulvey's analysis is impressive and telling throughout, and despite the fact that it is made in an essay of fewer than 13 pages, its influence has been enormous. However, having acknowledged the essay's power and influence, it should also be noted that Mulvey's solution is somewhat less telling than her analysis of the problem as an alternative to popular cinema. She calls for an avant-garde cinema which is radical in both a political and aesthetic sense of challenges the basic assumptions of the mainstream film. Some feminists, including Lorraine Jaman or Gaman and Margaret Marshman on 1988, have begun to doubt the universal validity of Mulvey's argument, questioning whether the gaze is always male or whether it is merely dominant among a range of different ways of seeing, including the female gaze. They advocate a cultural politics of intervention. According to them, we cannot afford to dismiss the popular by always positioning ourselves outside. It is, it is from popular culture that most people in our society get their entertainment and their information. It is here that men and women are offered the culture's dominant definitions of themselves. It would be therefore seem crucial to explore the possibilities and pitfalls of intervention in popular forms in order to find ways of making feminist meanings as part of pleasures. Escapism is one of the most frequently cited reasons given by the women for going to the cinema, seeking to avoid the perogative connotations of escapism, Stacy uses Richard's Dayers, a 1999 excellent argument for the utopian sensibility of much population entertainment, to construct an account of the utopian possibilities of Hollywood cinema for British women in the 1940s and 1950s. Dayer deploys a set of binary oppositions to rebuild the relationship between the social problems and experience by audiences and the textual solutions played out in the text of popular entertainment. Meanwhile, in the Philippines, no film succeeds without women. From mainstream box office successes and independent filmmaking international recognition to the regional initiatives to support aspiring filmmakers, Women have always been part of the country's cinema landscape. But while roles may earn women on the screen the status and appeal to of a celebrity, large strides are oftentimes hampered by the barriers behind the scenes. Today, a hundred years after the industry started the Philippines, women still face these challenges. And lastly, the Reading Romance. In Loving a Vengeance, Tanya Modelsky of 1982 asserted that women who write about feminine narratives choose one of these three approaches. The dismissiveness, antagonism, or most commonly, a mocking stone. In response, she declared that it is the time to start a feminist reading of women's literature. She claimed that mass-produced fantasies for women such as the romance book reflect very real issues and tensions in women's life. Despite this, she admitted that this way narratives address difficulties and tensions will really, if ever, suit current feminists. The feminist reader in the feminist uh, reader of fantasies, on the other hand, shared dissatisfaction with women's life. In the meantime, neither the novels nor the women who read 
them are criticized by model ski. Rather, she blamed the circumstances that lead to their existence, arguing that the contradictions in women's lives are to blame for their existence. She slid towards, back then, away from Mars full force in religion, leaving her, despite her complaints, extremely close to the mass culture viewpoint of popular culture as opiate. Nonetheless, Modelski observed that students occasionally skip women's study sessions in order to catch up their favorites of opera. When this happens, it's time to stop fighting soap operas and start including them as well as other mass-produced fantasies. On the other hand, Rosalind Cowards of 1984, Female Desire is about women's enjoyment in popular culture, fashion, romance, pop music, horoscopes, soap operas, foods, cookery, women's predicaments, and other texts are and activities that engage women in a never-ending loop of pleasure and guilt were examined in the book. Coward did not approach the material from the perspective of an outsider. The joys described by the coward are often critical as if someone were peering into one's life by a, a microscope. Her position is diametrically opposed to the culture and civilization tradition or the Frankfurt School perspective. She went on to say that popular culture isn't looked down on as much as other people, other people's disappointing but predicted culture. This is a culture discussion. She also refused to acknowledge the activities and representations of Coward's interest in romance literature stemmed in part from the intriguing fact that emergence of feminism has been almost perfectly paralleled by a mushroom increase of a popularity of romantic fiction during the past decades, which is the 1970s. She had two beliefs about romance novels. First, they must still meet some very specific requirements. Second, they provide evidence and contribute to a very powerful and widespread fantasy. Watching Dallas Ian Ang's Watching Dallas was originally published in the Netherlands in 1982. The context for Ang's study is the emergence of the American primetime soap Dallas as an international success in the early 1980s. In the Netherlands, Dallas was regularly watched by 52% of the population. It is in this context that Ang published the following advertisement in Viva, a Dutch woman's magazine. Following the advertisement, she received 42 letters from both lovers and haters of Dallas. This formed the empirical basis of her study of the pleasures of watching Dallas for its predominantly female audience. She is not concerned with pleasure understood as the satisfaction of an already persistent need but the mechanisms by which pleasure is aroused. For Ang's letter writers, the pleasures or displeasures of Dallas are inextricably linked with questions of realism. The extent to which the letter writer finds the program good or bad is determined by whether they find it realistic or unrealistic. She connects this to the way in which Dallas can be read on two levels, the level of denotation and the level of connotation. The level of denotation refers to the literal content of the program, general storyline, character interactions, and more. The level of connotations refers to the associations, implications, which resonate from the storyline and character interactions, and more. Viewing Dallas, like watching any other program, is a selective process, reading across the text from denotation to connotation, weaving our sense of self in and out of the narrative. It is this ability to make our own lives connect with the lives of a family of techs and millionaires that gives the program its emotional realism. Those who find it realistic shift the focus of attention from the particularity of the narrative to the generality of themes. Ang is the term a tragic structure of feeling to describe the way in which Dallas plays with the emotions in an endless musical chairs of happiness and misery. In order to activate Dallas's tragic structure of feeling, the viewer must have the necessary cultural capital to occupy a reading formation and form the what she calls following Peter Brook, the melodramatic imagination. 
The melodramatic imagination activates Dallas' tragic structure of feeling, which in turn produces the pleasure of emotional realism. However, because the melodramatic imagination is an effect of a specific reading formation, it follows that not all viewers of Dallas will activate the text in this way. A key concept in Anne's analysis is what she calls the ideology of mass culture. The ideology articulates the view that popular culture is a product of capitalist commodity production and is therefore subject to the laws of the capitalist market economy, the result of which is the seemingly endless circulation of degraded communities whose only real significance is that they make a profit for their producers. The ideology of mass culture, like other ideological discourses, seek to interpolate individuals into specific subject positions. The letters suggest four positions from which to consume Dallas. 1. Those who hate the program. 2. Ironically viewers. 3. Fans. and 4. Populists. Those that the writers who claim to hate Dallas drew most clearly on the ideology. First, the program is identified negatively as an example of the mass culture. Second, to account for and support the dislike of the program. In this way, the ideology both comforts and reassures. Viewers who occupy the second position demonstrate how it is possible to like Dallas and still subscribe to the ideology of mass culture. The contradiction is resolved by mockery and irony. Dallas is subjected to an ironizing and mocking commentary in which it is transformed from a seriously intended melodrama to the reverse, a comedy to be laughed at. For both the ironizing viewer and the hater of Dallas, the ideology of mass culture operates as a bedrock of common sense, making judgments of obvious and self-evident. Although both rock operate within the normative standards of the ideology, the difference between them is marked by the question of pleasure. Thirdly, there are the fans, those who love Dallas. For the viewers who occupy the previous two positions, to actually like Dallas without resort to army is to be identified as someone duped by mass culture. The claim is presented with all the confidence of having the full weight of the ideology's discur discursive support. Ang analysis the different strategies that those who love Dallas must use to deal consciously and unconsciously with such condescension. The first strategy is to internalize the ideology, to acknowledge the dangers of Dallas, but to declare one's ability to deal with them in order to derive pleasure from the program. A second strategy used by fans is to confront the ideology of mass culture. A third strategy of defense deployed by fans against the normative standard of the ma ideology of mass culture is to use irony. These fans are different from Ang's second category of viewer, the ironist, in that their strategy involves the use of surface irony to justify what is in all other respects a form of non-ironic pleasure. As Ang shows, the fans of Dallas find it necessary to locate their pleasure in relation to the ideology of mass culture. They internalize the ideology, they negotiate with the ideology, they use surface and the irony to defend their pleasure against the withering dismissal of the ideology. What all these strategies of defense reveal is that there is no clear-cut ideological alternative which can be employed against the ideology of mass culture, at least no alternative that offsets the latter in power of conviction and coherence. In short, these fans do not seem to be able to take up an effective ideological position and identity from which they can say in a positive way and independently of the ideology of mass culture, I like Dallas because. The final viewing position revealed in the letters, one that might help these fans, is a position formed by the ideology of populism. Given that this would seem to be an ideal discourse from which to defend one's pleasure in Dallas, why do so few of the letter writers adopt it? Compared to this, the ideology of mass culture has an extensive and elaborate range of arguments and theories. Little wonder then that when invited to explain why they like or dislike Dallas, the little writers find it difficult to escape the normative discourse of the ideology of mass culture. However, according to Eng, there are ways to escape. It is the very theoretical nature of the discourse which restricts its influence to people's opinions and rational consciousness, to the discourse people use when talking about culture. This would in part explain the contradictions experienced by some of the writers confronted by both the intellectual dominance of the ideology of mass culture and the spontaneous, practical attraction of the populist ideology.
However, drawing on the work of Bourdieu, Eng argues that populism is related to the popular aesthetic, in which the moral categories of middle class tastes are replaced by an emphasis on contingency, on pluralism, and above all, on pleasure. Pleasure for Eng is the key term in a transformed feminist cultural politics. The question Eng possesses is, can pleasure through identification with the woman of women's lippies or the emotionally massachist woman of soap operas have a meaning for women which is relatively independent of their political attitudes? Her answer is yes. Fantasy and fiction do not function in place of, but besides, other dimensions of life like social practice, moral, or political consciousness. Fiction and fantasy then function by making life in the present pleasurable or at least livable, but this does not by any means exclude radical political activity or consciousness. It does not follow that feminists must not persevere in trying to produce new fantasies and fight for a place for them. It does, however, mean that where cultural consumption is concerned, no fixed standard exists for gauging the progressiveness of a fantasy. The personal may be political, but the personal and the political do not always go hand in hand. In an unnecessarily hostile review of Watching Dallas, Nana Polan accuses Eng of simplifying questions of pleasure by not bringing into play psychoanalysis. He also claims that Eng's attack on the ideology of mass culture simply reverses the valuations implicit and explicit in the high culture or popular culture divide. Poland claims that Ang is attacking an antiquarian and anachronistic approach to mass culture and that she is out of touch with the new postmodern sensibility, still clinging instead to mythic notion of culture as tragedy, culture as meaning. Reading Women's Magazines In the preface to Inside Women's Magazines, Janice Winship explains how she has been doing research on women's magazines since 1969. She also tells us that it was also around the same time that she began to regard herself as a feminist. Part of the aim of Inside Women's Magazines is, then, to explain the appeal of the magazine formula and to critically consider its limitations and potential for change. Since their inception in the late 18th century, women's magazines have offered their readers a mixture of advice and entertainment. Regardless of politics, women's magazines continue to operate as survival manuals, providing their readers with practical advice on how to survive in a patriarchal culture. This might take the form of an explicit feminist politics as in Spare Rib, for example, or stories of women triumphing over adversity, as for example in Women's Own. The politics may be different but the formula is much the same. Women's magazines appeal to their readers by means of a combination of entertainment and useful advice. This can be the visual fictions of advertisements or items on fashion, cookery, or family and home. Each in its different way attempts to draw the reader into the world of the magazine and ultimately into the world of consumption. Magazine advertisements, like the magazines themselves, therefore provide a terrain on which to dream. In this way, they generate a desire for fulfillment. Paradoxically, this is deeply pleasurable because it also always acknowledges the existence of the labors of the everyday. Desire is generated for something more than the everyday, yet it can only be accomplished by what is for most women an everyday activity, shopping. What is ultimately being sold in the fiction of women's magazines and editorial or advertisements, fashion and home furnishing items, cookery and cosmetics, is successful and therefore pleasurable femininity. The problem with all this from a feminist perspective is that it is always constructed around a mythical individual woman, situated outside the influence of powerful social and cultural structures and constraints. The commitment to the individual solution is often revealed by the way in which women's magazines also seek to construct fictional collectivities of women. Here we often find women making sense of the everyday world through a mixture of optimism and fatalism. Winship identifies these tensions as an expression of women being ideologically bound to the personal terrain and in a position of a relative powerlessness about public events, like the so-called triumph of tragedy, stories, the readers, letters, and editorial responses often revealed a profound commitment to the individual solution. Thus, the We Women Feeling magazines construct is comprised of different cultural groups. The very notion of we in our world, however, constantly undercuts those divisions to give the semblance of a unity inside magazines.
This perhaps even more evident on the problem page. Although the problems are personal and therefore seek personal solutions, we should argue that unless women have access to knowledge which explains personal lives in social terms, the on us on you to solve your problem is likely to be intimidating or only lead to frustrated solutions. As Winship points out, a personal solution to this problem cannot begin to tackle the social and cultural heritage of the sexual double standard. At the center of Winship's book are three chapters, which in turn discuss the individual and family values of women's own, the heterosexual liberation of ideology of cosmopolitan, and the feminist politics of spare rib. Discussing spare ribs, reviews of popular film and television, which responds with comments that echo through much recent post-feminist analysis on popular culture. These reviews bolster their viewers' position and raise feminism and feminists to the lofty pedestal of having seen the light, with the consequent dismissal not only of a whole range of cultural events but also of many women's pleasurable and interested experiences of them. Whether intentionally or not, feminists are setting themselves distinctly apart. Us who know and reject most popular culture forms, including women's magazines, them who remain in ignorance and continue to buy women's own or watch Dallas. The irony, however, is that many of us feel like them, now set readers and viewers of this fair. Winship's comments bring us to the complex question of post-feminism. According to Winship, if it means anything useful, the term refers to the way in which the boundaries between feminists and non-feminists have become fuzzy. This is to a large extent due to the way in which with the success of feminism, some feminist ideas no longer have an oppositional charge but have become part of many people's, not just a minority's, common sense. Of course, this does not mean that all feminist demands have been met and that feminism is new redundant. On the contrary, it suggests that feminism no longer has a simple coherence around a set of easily defined principles, but instead is a much richer, more diverse, and contradictory mix than it ever was in 1970s. In reading women's magazines, Joe Hermes begins with an observation on previous feminist work on women's magazines. Hermes advocates what she calls a more postmodern view in which respect rather than concern or, for that matter, celebration a term often seen as the hallmark of a postmodern perspective, would have a central place. Working from the perspective of a postmodern feminist position, she advocates an appreciation that readers are producers of meaning rather than the cultural loops of the media institutions. More specifically, she seeks to situate her work in a middle ground between a focus on how meanings are made of specific texts and a focus on the context of media consumption. In working this way, she can avoid the deployment of textual analysis, with its implied notion of identifiable correct meaning or limited set of meanings, which a reader may or may not activate. Hermes conducted 80 interviews with both women and men. She was initially disappointed at the fact that her interviewees seemed reluctant to talk about how they made meanings from the women's magazines they read. And when they did discuss this issue, they often suggested instead, against the common sense of much media and cultural theory, that their encounters with these magazines were hardly meaningful at all. After the initial disappointment, these discussions gradually prompted Hermes to recognize what she calls the fallacy of meaningfulness. What this phrase is intended to convey is her rejection of a way of working in media and cultural analysis that is premised on the view that the encounter between reader and text should always be understood solely in terms of the production of meaning. This general preoccupation with meaning, she claims, has resulted from an influential body of work that concentrated on funds rather than on the consumption practices of ordinary people, and, moreover, it resulted from a conspicuous failure to situate consumption in the contents of everyday life. Against the influence of this body of work, she argues for a critical perspective in which the media text has to be displaced in favor of readers' reports of their everyday lives. By a detailed and critical analysis of recurrent themes and repeated issues that arise in the interview material she collected, Hermes attempts to reconstruct the various repertoire employed by the interviewees in the consumption of women's magazines. She identifies four repertoires, easily put down, relaxation, practical knowledge, and emotional learning and connected knowing. The first of these repertoires identifies women's magazines as a genre that makes limited demands on its readers. 
It is a genre that can be easily picked up and easily put down. And because of this, it can be easily accommodated into the routines of everyday life. The second repertoire identifies reading women's magazines as a form of relaxation. Given the low cultural status of women's magazines, using the term relaxation as a means to block further entry into a private realm is perhaps understandable. The third repertoire, the repertoire of practical knowledge, can range from tips on cooking to film and book reviews. The repertoire of practical knowledge may offer much more than practical hints on how to become adept at making Indian cuisine or culturally knowing about which films are worth going to the cinema to see. The final repertoire, the repertoire of emotional learning and connected knowing. It's also about learning, but rather than being about the collection of practical tips, it is learning through the recognition of oneself, one's lifestyles, and one's potential problems, and the problems of others as represented in the pages of magazine, stories, and articles. As with the repertoire of practical knowledge, the repertoire of emotional and connected learning may also involve the production of an ideal self, a self who is prepared for all the potential emotional dangers and human crises that might need to be confronted in the social practices of everyday life. As Hermes explains, both the repertoire of practical knowledge and the repertoire of connected knowing may help readers to gain sense of identity and confidence, of being in control or feeling at peace with life that lasts while they are reading and dissipates quickly when the magazine is put down. Hermes' originality is to have broken decisively with an approach to cultural analysis in which the researcher insists on the necessity to establish first the substantive meaning of a text or texts and then how an audience may or may not read the text to make this meaning. Against this way of working, as she observes, the repertoires that readers use give meaning to women's magazine genres in a way that to a quite remarkable extent is independent of the women's magazine text. Readers construct new texts in the form of fantasies and imagined new selves. This leads to the conclusion that a genre study can be based entirely on how women's magazines are read and that it does not need to address the narrative, structure, or content of the text itself at all. Against more celebratory accounts of women and consumption, Hermes's investigation of the role of repertoires made her reluctant to see in the practices of women reading magazines an unproblematic form of empowerment. Instead, she argues, we should think of the consumption of women's magazines as providing only temporary moments of empowerment. Men's Studies and Masculinities Despite Peter Stringer's concern that for a man to think about masculinity is to become less masculine oneself, the real man thinks about practical matters rather than abstract ones and certainly does not put upon himself or the nature of his sexuality. Many men have thought, spoken, and written about masculinity. As Anthony Eastwood writes in What a Man's Gonna Do, it is time to try to speak about masculinity, about what it is and how it works. Eastwood's focus on what he calls dominant masculinity. He begins from the proposition that masculinity is a cultural construct, but it is, it is not natural, normal, or universal. He argues that dominant masculinity operates as a gender norm and that it is against this norm that the many other different types of lived masculinities are invited to measure themselves. As part of this argument, he analyzes the way dominant masculinity is represented across a range of popular cultural texts, pop songs, popular fiction, films, television, and newspapers, and concludes, clearly men do not possibly live out of the masculinity, masculine myth imposed by the stories and images of the dominant culture. From a similar perspective, Shaw makes an examination of new men, masculinity explores it as a regime of representation, focusing on four key sites of cultural circulation, television, advertising, press advertising, menswear shops, and popular magazines for men. Although it is true that feminists have always encouraged men to examine their masculinity, many feminists are less than impressed with men's studies. As Joyce Cannon and Kristen Griffin make clear, while feminists' understandings of patriarchy would undoubtedly be wider if we had access to men's understandings of how they construct and transform this pervasive system of relationships, we nevertheless fear that such research might distort, belittle, or deny women's experiences with men and masculinity. Feminists, therefore, must be even more insistent about conducting research on men and masculinity at a time when a growing number of men are beginning to conduct apparently comparable research. Queer Theory 
Square theory, a small version and collaborative sonic spin, provides a discipline for exploring the relationships between lesbians, gay men, and the culture which surrounds and continues to seek to exclude us. Queer theory seeks to locate queerness in places that had previously been thought of as strictly for the streets. In this way, they contend queer theory is no more about lesbians and gay men than women's studies is about women. Part of the project of queer is to attack the very naturalness of gender and, by extension, the fiction's supporting compulsory heterosexuality. To discuss the supposed naturalness of gender and the ideological fictions supporting compulsory heterosexuality, there's no better place to begin than with one of the founding texts of queer theory, Judith Butler's very influential book, Gender Trouble. Butler begins from Simone de Beauvoir's observation that one is not born a woman, but rather becomes one. De Beauvoir's distinction establishes an analytical difference between biological sex and gender, suggesting that while biological sex is stable, there will always be different and competing versions of femininity and masculinity. Although de Beauvoir's argument has the advantage of seeing gender as something made in culture and not something fixed by nature, the problem with this model of sex or gender, according to Butler, is that it works with the assumption that there are only two biological sexes, male and female, which are determined by nature, and which in turn generate and guarantee the binary gender system. Against this position, she argues that biology is itself always already culturally gendered as male and female, and as such, already guarantees a particular version of the feminine and the masculine. Therefore, the distinction between sex and gender is not a distinction between nature and culture. The category of sex is itself a gendered category, fully politically invested, naturalized but not natural. In other words, there is not a biological truth at the heart of gender, sex and gender are both cultural categories. Furthermore, it is not just that gender is not to culture as sex is to nature. Gender is also the discursive cultural means by which sex, nature, or a natural sex is produced and established as pre-discursive prior to culture, a politically neutral surface on which culture acts. The internal stability and binary frame for sex is effectively secured by casting the duality of sex in a pre-discursive domain. According to Butler's argument, gender is not the expression of biological sex. It is performatively constructed in culture. Gender identities consist of the accumulation of what is outside, in the belief that they are in expression of what is inside. As a result, persons only become intelligible through becoming gendered in conformity with recognizable standards of intelligibility. Femininity and masculinity are not expressions of nature. They are cultural performances in which their naturalness is constituted through the exclusively constrained performative acts that create the effect of the natural, the original, and the inevitable. Butler's theory of performativity is a development of Austin's theory of performative language. Austin divides language into two types, constative and performative. Constative language is a descriptive language. Performative language, on the other hand, does not merely describe what already exists. It brings something into being. Butler argues that gender works in the much same way as performative language. One of the first performative speeches acts we all encounter is the pronouncement, it's a girl or it's a boy. Various discourses, including those from parents, educational institutions, the media, we all combine to ensure our conformity to performativity as cultural ritual, as the irritation of cultural norms. In this way, the performance of gender creates the illusion of a prior substantiality and controls the effect of the performative ritual of gender as necessary emanations or casual consequences of that prior substance. Butler's concept of performativity should not be confused with the idea of performance understood as a form of play acting, in which a more fundamental identity remains intact beneath the theatricality of the identity on display. Gender performativity is not a voluntary practice, it is a continual process of almost disciplinary reiteration. Gender performativity cannot be theorized apart from the forcible and reiterative practice of regulatory sexual regions, and in no way presupposes a choosing subject. Butler chooses drug as a model for explanation, as some critics seem to think, because she thinks it is an example of the subversion of gender.
but because it dramatizes the signifying gestures through which gender itself is established. Drug exposes the assumed and apparent unity and fictional coherence of the normative heterosexual performance of gender. To be in drug is not to copy an original and natural gender identity. It is to imitate the myth of originality itself. Gender gives the example of Aretha Franklin singing, You make me feel like a natural woman. She seems at first to suggest that some natural potential of her biological sex is actualized by her participation in the cultural position of woman as object of heterosexual recognition. Although Aretha appears to be all too glad to have her naturalness confirmed, she also seems fully and paradoxically mindful that confirmation is never guaranteed, that the effect of naturalness is only achieved because of that moment of heterosexual recognition. If, as Butler maintains, gender reality is created through sustained social performances, perhaps one of the principal theaters for its creation is consumption. Michael Warner has noted a connection between gay culture and particular patterns of consumption. Gay culture in this most visible mode is anything but external to advised capitalism and to precisely those features of advanced capitalism that many on the left are most eager to disavow. In a similar way, Curry K. Crickmore and Alexander Doty point out that the identity that we designate homosexual arose in tandem with capitalist consumer culture. They draw attention to the particular relationship that gays and lesbians have often had with popular culture. A central issue is how to be out in culture, how to occupy a place in a mass culture yet maintain a perspective on it that does not accept in homophobic and heterocentric definitions, image, and terms of analysis. Alexander Doty argues that queerness as a mass culture reception progress is shared by all sorts of people in varying degrees of consistency and intensity. As he explains, queer reading is not confined to gays and lesbians, heterosexual, straight identifying people, and experience queer moments. The queer space identified by Doty is, as he explains, best all of us a contra straight rather than strictly anti straight space. Queer positions, queer readings, and queer pleasures are part of a reception space that stands simultaneously beside and within that created by heterosexual and straight positions.